when you see people worship. But when we sing this song, Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. He'll never fail. And you say, well, he just said you buried your wife. Song like he failed, you know, you don't understand. Because if my wife uh, didn't die, we would not have a funeral. If we had no funeral, Pastor Isle would not have to come and hear me preach at the funeral. If I didn't have to preach no funeral and Pastor Isle did not have to travel to Texas to hear me preach a funeral that didn't have to occur and my wife didn't die, then he would not have heard so that he would have said and the Spirit of God would have moved and say that I need to be here. And so <laughs> this is the beauty of God. When you think it's out, you see cricket and the umpire says not out. Even at the worst day, it looks like we're experiencing here in history. And the Bible declares that to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. And so he won't fail. He cannot fail. And so out of that transition, now we have new life. Amen. We've got men that are giving their life to Christ. And I can't imagine the joy and Audrey spirit in heaven worshiping God and knowing that where it began with us, I am getting a rebirth, if you would. Amen. This is the best place that I could be. It's the only place that I needed to be. And God in his providence weave the steps of our lives, he said, are ordained and he connects the dots. And while we don't quite understand what's happening, he's behind the scenes putting it together. So I, I thank God for the connections. I thank God for my friend, my brother, Pastor Al. And they've, they've, they've been, you know, People don't understand, why would you come? Well, it was free hotel kind of deal. <laughs> Plus, you know, when you get married and you're in the work of God, you want your wife to meet your accountable partner. You see, Pastor Al, I've got a lot of friends, a lot of good friends from Dominica. I travel with those guys. But Pastor Al is the guy that I talk to. You know, when I, I need to talk matters of the faith because we were both pastor kids and we followed in the footsteps of our father. So I, I, I thank God that we have this bond and it's brought life to me. I, I'm, I'm refreshed. I'm refreshed. He won't fail. He cannot fail. And my brother is here. Uh, my brother is probably almost twice my height. Well, not really. <laughs> but, but he's tall. Yeah, and um, you know, my brother told him I was coming out here. He was born in St. Vincent, so he's the reverse, and, and he lived in Dominica, so he's a Vinci guy. And uh, he's like, yeah, I'm going to come with you, so we worked it out. After lunch, I'll head up to Georgetown to see my um, grandmother. Imagine this, the last time I was here was the time I got married. Yeah, and so um, I, I think this is a good bookends for... For my wife, God, God knows how to put things together, man. I'm, 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 let's just get to the word. I could go on forever, but we're not here for this. We're here to hear from God, and that's what we're going to do. So I want to continue and finish. You know, there's power in a set. So we've got a series, and without the last piece, you kind of lose the effectiveness of the set. So we have to complete it. And so we started this set of messages, the series on sibling rivalry. And the men who were at the Palooza, we started out on Thursday and we looked at the fight for praise. And we started in Genesis chapter 4 where we looked at the rivalry between Cain and Abel. You remember God asked them to, uh, well, they, they went to, to worship, the Bible says, and Cain presented his uh, offering to, to God and Abel did likewise. And the Bible says God had regards for Abel and his offering, but not for Cain. Cain gets so upset after this worship service uh, that, that he began to eye his brother. He was filled with hate. 
God visited him and said, something is wrong with you. You need to check your spirit. And he wouldn't. And you know what it led to, the first murder in the history of mankind. And so you won't believe it, but folk will see you worship and God receives your worship and pours favor on your life. And we got folk fighting church folk and jealousy. And next thing you know, it's the sibling rivalry. And then we looked at uh, Ishmael and Isaac, Abraham's son. God promised Abraham and Sarah that he would give them a son. And he said, you know, the descendants of, of the earth will be named from your heritage. And Abraham and Sarah, after 10 years, couldn't wait no more. Sarah pulled this Jerry Springer type deal <laughs> and told Abe's, you know, Abe's, it ain't working out. You, you ain't getting younger. Uh, you, 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 here's my maid. Abraham looked at it. He said, uh, I don't know. That don't sound... But she was looking good. Abraham said, man, that might be a one-time offer. I'm going to do it. <laughs> and so and they had Ishmael, and God visited Sarah just as he said he would. And so now they're raising Ishmael with Isaac. Some of you all raising what you created with the promise of God, and now you got conflict in your life. And you're trying to keep on to both. Abraham said, I, he's my son. I can't kick him out. God said, this time I want you to listen to Sarah. You might want to listen to Sarah today. Well, we talked to the men about that already. And so we saw that, the fight for the promise. And then we finished up on yesterday uh, with the fight for position where we looked at uh, Jacob and Esau. The Bible says the first record of twins in history was with Rebecca who was pregnant and she prayed. The Bible says her husband Isaac prayed for her. For 20 years or 19 years, Isaac is praying for his wife because she was barren. And the Bible says that God answered his prayer and Rebecca was pregnant. And she was probably rejoicing like every new mom, you know, to see the little stick on the thing is blue. And she put it there on the dinner plate and Isaac came home. He lift up the thing and Isaac's like, no, baby, you ain't see. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, no, no, you sure? You sure? And they wait for a couple of while before they tell anybody. You know how it is. Because she you probably had miscarriage before something. And after three months, everybody knows. And the Bible says something unique was going on with Rebecca. Because she was so excited about this stuff. But then she began to feel a tugging inside her. It was unusual. It was not like nothing like anybody else ever spoke about. She asked her girlfriends them in a little women's group. And why is the morning sickness? Now, this is no morning sickness. The Bible said because it troubled her so much. She says, God, if this was from you, why is it so troubling? And the Bible says that God spoke to her this prophetic word. And he said that there are two nations within you. He says, uh, two people will come from you. One will be stronger than the other. And, and, and he says, the younger will rule. The older will have to serve the younger. And so God told her right then that the younger boy, he would reverse the birth order. And there comes the twin. One is hairy and, and wild and he likes to hunt. And this is Esau. And the Bible says at the birth canal when they were being delivered, Esau came out first. But Jacob was grabbing at his heel. Mm -hmm. This is what happens when you get saved. Your old man that came out yerry and wild and wants to do all the things in the world. And your new man that you just receive and you save. You still got conflict but he's grabbing at. Because ultimately the old man must subject itself to the new man. And so the sibling rivalry was demonstrated there. And eventually we saw Jacob now. Trying to connive himself into the position that God had already said he had. And he's trying to sell, uh, buy Esau's birthright from him. You tell something about the character of Esau because he gave it up. Esau said, I'm hungry. I'm about to die. What is a birthright to me if I die? The brother just missed one meal. But Jacob is working on his plan. That I'm going to buy my way into what I suspect is on my life. Some of you got a calling on your life. And you're trying to work on it so much that you forget that it is God who gave you the calling. And so 
sibling rivalry. And now we pick up in chapter uh, 28. And so this installment, the fight for passion. And because we're in the service, I'm going to focus on sibling rivalry among sisters today. Oh yeah, you see what I did? We deal with the men first. Mm -hmm, that's how God orders it. Three men. We saw the rivalry. Now we're going to look at it with the sisters. So Genesis chapter 29 verse 31 to 35 is our theme. I'm going to read that first and then I'll catch you up uh, in the introduction. Is that okay this morning? All right. Genesis 29 uh, verse 31 to 35. And you should have a note sheet with you. Let's go into it. Now the Lord saw that Leah was unloved. And he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. Leah conceived and bore a son and named him Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has seen my affliction, surely now my husband will love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me his son, this son also. She named him Simeon. She conceived, I mean, that's a whole lot of conceiving. By this time now, you'd think, you know, yeah, very prolific, you call that. Rabbit kind of, you know, behavior here. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore he was named Levi. And then she conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she named him Judah. Then she stopped bearing. Heavenly Father, God, before I go any further, God, I pray that I will decrease, that you may increase. And God, just as you delivered this word through my spirit, God, that it will flow through everyone under the hearing of my voice. God, bless your word. God, may your, the, the hearers be attentive, God, and may they receive it. Who that has ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit has to say this morning. God bless you. All right, so... I brought you up to speed. So the last time we saw Jacob and Esau, Jacob had now connived his way in. He and his mother, Rebecca, had tricked their, his father, Isaac, into believing that he was Esau. And so now, Jacob received the blessing from his father. And Esau comes in with the meal that his father was anticipating that he would bring so that he would bless him before he dies. And Esau found out that Jacob had, Jacob had already received that blessing from Isaac. And so right now, Jacob is in a problem that he created. And so we pick up in chapter 28, verse 1 to 2. And let's see what it says here. So Isaac called Jacob... And blessed him and charged him and said to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. I don't want you to mix around with these girls here in Kingstown. Don't, don't mess with them. No, no, nobody from, from, from this area here. I want you to go back to Georgetown. Ah, uh, country folk in the house. I know they call you country, but... He says, I want you to go back. Arise and go up to Pandaram to the house of Bethuel, where your mother's father, and from there take to yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. So if you're taking notes, Jacob is sent to Bethuel's house. Jacob is sent to Bethuel's house. He is on the run. You see that in your notes? All right. So Isaac now realized he's got conflict in his house between his boys. And he says, I want you to get away from here because your brother might take you out anyways. So you need to go. But I don't want you to go anywhere. I don't want you to mess around with these women. Here. I want you to go and I want you to find a wife from your uncle's house. And so the Bible says... He continues, may God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of peoples. And so in the next few verses, we see Jacob on this journey. 
And the Bible says, as Jacob journeyed on, he needed to rest and refresh himself. So he took a camping spot. And the Bible says, he took a stone and made a pillow out of a stone. You have to be in some sort of trouble for you to sleep on some pillow. That is a stone. The boy have a rough. He's on the run. And the Bible says, if we pick up in verse 10, then Jacob departed from Bathsheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and he spent the night there because the sun had set and he took one of the stones of the place and he put it under his head and laid down in that place. He had a dream and in that dream he saw a ladder that is descending from heaven and angels are going up and down, conveying the spirit of the Lord coming down and going up. And the Bible says in verse 15, the angel spoke to him and said, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Jacob, point two, encounters God at Bethel. He is revived. Remember, he's on the run. And so now he's in this place where he hears from God and God gives him this word that non-doubtly revived his spirit. Because God said, I am with you. I know you don't feel like God is with you right now. Because you don't connive your way. You know the mistakes you've made. You know what they've done. And now your sin that was in private is now in the public. And people are not talking to you. People are shunning you. But the Bible says this same Jacob that just tricked his father and lied several times together with his mom. The Bible says God said of this man that I am with you. Yeah. Oh that ought to give somebody more joy than just this. That even when you went your own way and you do things outside of the will of God because of his grace and his mercy, he says, I am with you. He says, I will keep you. He says, I will bring you back. Oh, I know you don't feel like you can ever go back to these people no more because now they know what you've done. And Oh, you all don't want to tell the truth today. And so he says... I will fulfill my promise to you. And Jacob called the name of this place Bethel. It will become a significant place in his life in the future. Where he goes back to this place to remember what God had promised him. Some of you all, you are on your journey to Bethel right now. When you get there, take a pause and hear from God. Today might be that day. And so, we now go into chapter 29. And we pick up, he gets to the place. He's at the gates of the city in Haran where he was sent. And he has this unusual encounter that's going to change his life. So if we read from verse 1, I'm not going to read all the verses, but I'm just going to summarize for you. He gets into the city. He gets right on the outskirts and he meets a number of uh, shepherds. You know, people taking care of sheep and they're at the well and they're waiting right there. And Jacob comes out and Jacob is like, hey, why don't you all move the stone and start giving the sheep water? And they said to him, no, we can't do that now because all of the men that are responsible to move this stone have not come in yet. So we need to wait. And then he asked them about his uncle. He says, do you know my uncle Laban? And they said, yes, we know him. And he asked them, is he well? And verse 6, he said to them, is it well with him? And they said, it is well. And then they said to him, here is Rachel, his daughter. She's coming with the sheep. Because she was a shepherdess, it says. And then they explained at that point, we've got to wait till everybody comes in. But something unique happens here. Let's read on. Verse 9. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. So the first time they point her out in the distance, now she's right there with them. Verse 10. When Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob went up 
and rolled the stone from the mouth of the well and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Now you got to pay attention when you read the Bible. Something is so unique about this encounter that a job that several men would do, one man is doing it. And the only thing unique about it is the fact that this one man just saw this woman for the first time in his life and this woman is knocked down. This woman is like Beyonce or something. <laughs> Coca-Cola bottle figure. He saw her and the Bible says she was so tantalizing when he saw her that he become so enraged with power. He moved the stone and he says, we got to take care of my baby right here. You know what it's like when you're in grammar school and you go down to convent. You see this girl, you're trying to impress them. Oh, come on. You go down to girls, it's the girls' high school is what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. And you're down here and you're trying to walk tough and, you know, behave like you've been in the gym and stuff. Did Jacob move the stone by himself? I tell my wife before she passed away, baby, I know eventually we'll get to heaven, but when I get there, I want to go see Rachel first. Because I picked you out. I know what you look like already. I got you. But this Rachel got to be some sort of amazing woman. Because I'm, look at this. Let's keep going. Verse 11. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted his voice and wept. What kind of man whips around other men just by kissing a woman. She had to be some sort of woman. <laughs> you got to be fine. And the Bible says, he wept. Mm. Verse 3, I mean number 3, sorry. Jacob was baffled by Rachel. She knocked him off his feet. It's supposed to be the other way around. This dude had lost all equilibrium. He couldn't even. He wept. So he is ravished by her. Point number three. Jacob baffled by Rachel. He's ravished. He's in love. It's love at first sight. It's good kind of first sight love. Not the kind of stuff that happens with folk on the internet now. Uh, uh, oh, you know I know this is happening down here. Uh-huh. And so we go on to chapter, uh, we, we, where we are, we're in chap yeah, chapter 29, verse 18. I want to walk you through this, but I'm going to go up to uh, verse 14. Because now they did this thing at the well. Rachel brings him home and he's having dinner with his uncle and the whole family. All right, let's pick up, let's read. It gets, it gets really good. Yeah. Laban said to him, surely you are my bone and my flesh, verse 14. And he stayed with him a month. So Jacob is living with the family now for one month. He had a chance to see what's going on in the house. You know, Laban is, is pretty decent in terms of his, 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 you know, his flock and stuff. And verse 15, then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me what shall your wages be? Mm -hmm. And so, now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. And the name of the younger was Rachel. That's the one the brother saw and he's in love with. Look what it says here, verse 17. And Leah's eyes were weak. But Rachel was beautiful of form and face. I told you she had a Coca-Cola bottle figure. I thought I ain't lying. I didn't make this thing up. I just read the Bible and I bring it to life. She was beautiful in form and face. Uh, you know some women got a nice face but well let's leave that. Uh, my bad. My bad. My bad. Uh, but this woman this Rachel woman here she had the total package. And the Bible says the sister, before we talk about Rachel, he talks about Leah. And all he says, her eyes was weak. Now, you know, somebody trying to introduce you to their girlfriend or something or the little baby, new baby. It, it happens a lot with new babies. And they're like, hey, you seen my baby? And you're like, no. And they say, oh, let me see. And they open up the little creep thing and pull the little, you know, 
blanket out and you get to see the baby in food and you got a shock on your face, but you got to get rid of it quick. Because, you know, you know, you know, you know what that is. It can't just be me. And, and so they want you to say something. They're like, how, how you find the baby? And you sit there and you're like, oh, whoa, whoa. I didn't really prepare to answer this question. And you want to be, you still want to keep your salvation. You don't really want to be lying about stuff. I mean, and so you sit there and you're looking at this baby and you got to come quick because your face had already said something. And so all you can do is just say something about the baby's eyes. Say, oh, look at the baby's eyes. All he talks about Leah is that her eyes was weak. We don't know nothing else about Leah, but we do know when it transitioned from Leah with the bot, something significantly changed. I tell the guys, whenever you see bot, it's like you're going through one of these roundabouts and you just live in this lane and you got to take a, you're going somewhere else. And where he went is how beautiful she was. That means she's the opposite of that. <laughs> and so, point number four. We see Jacob bagging for Rachel, and he's reassured. Let's look at what happens next. Verse 19. Laban said, no, verse 18. Now Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Let's put it in the books. That's the bagging, number four. Jacob bagging for Rachel, and he is reassured. Because Laban said in verse 19, it is better... That I give her to you than to give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. Watch this. And they seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. This is some kind of woman. This brother is working in the field taking care of stupid sheep. Stinky sheep. And he's doing this thing at a maximum term, seven years. And the Bible says, this seven years didn't even feel like a week to him. Or oh, some of you are saying, I wish my husband would behave that way. I don't cook one bad meal in the whole year. He want to talk about why the rice was so wet. <laughs> but he worked for seven years. A life sentence, the maximum. And the Bible says it seemed to him but for a few days. So now let's see what happens next. Then Jacob said to Laban at the end of the seven year term, verse 21, Give me my wife for my time is completed that I may go into her. Laban gathered all the men of the place and made a feast. This is a big wedding. This is kind of like the wedding you had in Bequay. Pastor Al, this is big time right there. Now in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and he brought her to him and Jacob went into her. Listen, Leah had to be some sort of ugly woman. I'm going to tell you right now. I know, I know you want me to be politically correct, but something ain't right with this girl. Her father had to sneak her in to get. Can you imagine that? Your father had to cover your face as somebody don't work seven years and he's just sneaking you in to get you out of the house because then nobody passed by talking, hey, Mr. Laban, you know I want to talk to Leah. You know my son interested. Hey, nobody asked that question. <laughs> nobody wants Leah. And the Bible says, yeah. He went in onto her and Jacob thinks he's sleeping with, you know, they would be veiled. That was the custom of the time. That veil would only be re revealed after they had, you know, their first connection. This is the honeymoon time. Pastor, I'm glad that was not at your house because you couldn't deal with this kind of problem. Uh, There's a different kind of honeymoon right there. You don't want that heat. And the Bible says... You know, he also gave, in verse 24, it says, Laban also gave his maid Zilpha to his daughter Leah as a maid. That means she ain't coming back. He even give her help. Go on. <laughs> so it came about in the morning that behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Was it not Rachel that I served with you? Why then have you deceived me? What do you do when all your life you work for Rachel 
but you receive Aaliyah. What do you do when you work so hard all your life, first form, second form, third form, fourth form, fifth form, and you deal your CXC exams and you bring home a Leah looking type of results? What do you do? Well, everybody think you're going to be a rich as student and you come back and your grade looks like Leah. Your parents can't tell nobody what you did. You were first and second, first and second, and then you get to fifth form and you stink up the place. What do you do when you work for Rachel? You love your wife. You take care of your children. And then now you send them off and they're like vagabonds. What do you do? You raise them in the church and you prayed for them. You brought them to Sunday school. And that child you thought was a Rachel is now living like a Leah. What do you do? When you worked for Rachel, but you end up with Aaliyah. And that's the dilemma that Jacob finds himself. It gets worse. And so, verse 26, but Laban said, it is not the practice in our place to marry off the younger before the firstborn. Hold on a minute. This kind of song is familiar. Remember, Laban is Rebecca's, Jacob's mother, brother. And Rebecca was good at tricking her husband Isaac to believe that Jacob was Esau. And so now her brother is tricking her son that Josh was part of the trick on the front. Oh, so now number five. Jacob betrayed. He is reaping what he sowed. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful what you do with your decisions outside of the will of God. Whatsoever a man sow, that shall he reap. Oh, some of you are in reaping season right now. If that's you, just look straight ahead. Don't touch your husband. Don't touch your wife. Just look straight ahead. That's when you just look down in your Bible. Nobody ain't know what's going on but you and God. He's betrayed. The same trick he just pulled off is now on him. And his uncle is pulling it on him. Brother like sister. And the Bible says, Laban said, it is not the practice. We don't do things like that out here, man. Not, not, no. The way we do it, we marry off the first girl. Okay, so why is she in the house so long then? Uh, okay, let's keep moving. So, verse 27. Laban continues to say, complete the week of this one. Of this one. And we will give you the order also. He don't work for Rachel. Right? He worked for her seven years. He thought he was getting her. He did not. He got Leah. So now the father-in-law is saying, yeah, just, just, just work for this one now. Really? I didn't want to take her back. He says, no, no, that's not how we're doing it. Complete the weeks for this one and we'll give you the other. So you ain't going to get Rachel until you work another seven years. For the service which you shall serve with me for another seven years, he says. And Jacob did so and completed her weeks and he gave him his daughter Rachel as his wife. Some of you all haven't received your Rachel yet because you went on your own. And you tricked your way to where you got here. So now you have to work twice as hard if you had just waited on God. Oh, you know, yeah, I know. When, pe when people are that quiet, that means they're getting it. Yeah, you can't really, you, if you say something, people might think, oh, maybe that's in my house. So you just stay quiet. No, Pastor Al, you never mind when people are quiet in the service. That means the spirit of God is working. Uh-huh. Okay. So here we go. Now we got this issue and we pick up in our text. You got to understand what Jacob now has is two sisters in his house. The one that he really worked for, he loved. And the one that he was tricked into taking that he don't want to take to the mall. She will never, he'll never travel with her. She, you'll never see her at this new airport. He might drop out over there because no planes leaving here. But he ain't going to bring her in this international airport. She'll never travel with him. 
This is the kind of sister when he's working in the, in the field, he got a little text phone and a little data plan he just paid for. And, and, and Leah sends a text talking about, hey, baby, are you going to come home tonight? What time are you coming home? He just swiped past that. That, that thing, that, you know when you look at the check mark and you never want to view it because you don't want them to know you see it? That's how all Leah messages look like. It looked like the brother have no signal. Richard sends a message saying, hey, hey, Anna, just checking on you. He out there trying to do a FaceTime. Talking about, look at, look, look, look at the sheep. Look at me in the sheep. Look. Ain't got nothing to do with her. She's in the house. She's got a maid. Richard's got a maid. The brother have four women living under the same roof. And now the sister hit the sister because this sister that is Rachel, that is the one he loved, reminds Leah how much he doesn't love her. And he's like, I don't even know why you're here. Why don't you just go home? Just go home and meet daddy them. Leave us alone. My Jackie don't want you. you girl, girl, you don't embarrass. You don't try to embarrass yourself. Making breakfast. He not going to come by your room. Just pass by the kitchen and Leah cannot stand it no more. So Leah now depressed Leah in her room. Leah not coming out. Sibling rivalry. The fight for passion. She wants the man. So now we pick up with our text. Verse 31. Now the Lord saw. Aren't you glad? I, I, Aren't you glad that the Lord sees? The Bible says, now the Lord saw that Leah was unloved. I thank God for his grace that in heaven he looks down and he sees me in the point of my conflict. He saw that she was unloved. And he opened the womb. He gave her something that only she could give to Jacob. He opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Uh, she pretty face and a good character, good body form, but she can't make no key. Oh, God Almighty. And all Jacob wants is to ensure that the promise God gave him will come to fruition. But Rachel, he's been sleeping with her now for months and ain't nothing happening. And now Jacob's starting to think something might be wrong with him. Boy. So one day, he goes over to Leah's tent because God saw she wasn't loved. I don't know how he did it. Because he didn't like the sister. You know that. So maybe he didn't have no lights. He go in. Eh, eh. They do their business. Next thing you know. One month in. Leah start to show. Quick, quick, quick pregnancy. That's good stuff. So now Leah walking in the house. And Leah refused to close. Leah, so Leah walking. <laughs> Everywhere you see Leah. Leah is like this. Oh, Rachel can't stand Leah. Because Leah pregnant and Rachel pretty, but she ain't got no baby. Because the Lord saw she was unloved. And he opened her womb. Verse 32. Leah conceived and bore a son and named him Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has seen my affliction, surely now my husband, I got him on the hook. For nine months, Leah strutting herself up. Just what? Leah probably had the best pregnancy ever. Never really showed anybody she had money in sickness. You know, just make up herself every day. Leah living her best life. Nine months now, baby came and Leah is excited. Rachel still, blue face in the house. Now Rachel ain't coming out. Rachel don't want to go out with Jakey no more. Because Leah is making babies. All right. And the Bible says, she named him Reuben. When you respond to God during conflict, you might flip over and you see this notes to continue. How do we respond to God during a conflict? The first thing, we must shift, you must shift your focus from what you can see. The Bible says, when she had this first boy, she named him Reuben because the Lord has seen my affliction. She focused in on what she could see. And she says, oh, I, 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 I've been living with this mess. And God sees. And she thinks the Lord is at the level that she's at. And so she names him Reuben. She names him after her pain. Her pain was she wasn't seen. But now you're going to see me. Oh, she's in this thing now. 
He says, I know I'm in the building. You're going to see me when I show up. And so she spends her time. She actually names what God gifted her in her pain. She names it after the pain. And so you don't want to focus. You want to focus from what you can see. Shift that. Reuben means to see if you're taking notes. Point number two. Let's see what happens next. Then she conceived again, verse 33. And bought a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved. See, she's still in her feelings. That's what the young people say. He has therefore given me this son also. So she named him Simeon. First she says, and she focuses on what she can see. Then this time, she focuses on what she can hear. She says, no, I, I know you're going to hear my problems that I'm in. So God blesses her a second time and she moves from what she can see and she focuses on what she can hear. She says, I know people are hearing the problem. I mean, they hear the mess that's going on in my house. Because apparently, old Jackie was still spending time with Rachel. And so now, you want to shift your focus away from what you can hear. Because Simon means to hear. Simeon means to hear. Verse 34. I told you this woman is prolific. She conceived again. And she bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will become attached to me. Because I have bore him three sons. Therefore he was named Levi. She focuses on the touch. He says the first time, yeah, maybe it was a little fluke. I probably was a little too excited. Maybe I, maybe I flaunted too much. He didn't really see me, apparently. Second time, I thought everybody would hear, everybody would know when I come around. People would know what's going on, how I'm being mistreated and stuff. God is blessing her all this time. Because you saw what it said in the verse 31. God saw that she was in love and God is demonstrating his love for her. He's bountifully blessing her. But she keeps taking this blessing and naming them after pain. He won't see. He won't hear. And now she says he will touch. All the senses. Seeing. Hearing. Touching. She focuses on the flesh. But then something unique happens here. In verse in verse 35 and she conceived again and she bore a son and said this time oh if you if you got your bible and it is you, you underline in your bible underline this highlight this in your phone if you you got one of these electronic uh, phones here huh she says this time i will praise the lord there's a shift right here are you seeing this this morning? The first time I focus on what I can see. The second time I focus on what I can hear. The third time I focus on what I can touch. But this time. She says it's not working out for me. How many of you are in this place where every time you think things are going to change. You get to a different job and you still don't see things working out. You just keep shifting and shifting. The problem is not the jobs. The problem is you. Oh, some of you, you need a this time testimony. The Bible says she made up in her mind that this last three years have been filled with pregnancies and I ain't getting no difference in my life. They're still treating me. The problem is not them, Sister Leah. It's with you. And so the Bible says she declares this time I'm going to conduct myself differently. I'm going to shift my focus. And I'm going to praise the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, come on, somebody. She says, I'm going to shift. I'm going to take it off from what I can see, from what I can hear, from what I can touch. Because what is happening in my life is beyond what I can see, taste, touch. It is a not matter, not of flesh and blood, but this is spirit. And so I'm going to shift my focus and praise the Lord. I don't know about you. But I've worked in my life for Rachel and I had to bury. My wife looked like I received the Leah. 
And I've been walking with it. I've been, I, I've been dealing with it for two years, uh, watching her decline, watching her decline. I'm like, God, how does that speak to you blessing me? How does that speak to you moving in my life? It looked like all my life I have worked for one thing so that my wife and my children can reflect the love that you have over my life. And now I'm burying my wife before she turns 49. I say, God, this is, this don't speak to what I expected. It, it seems like somebody sneaked a lee on me. And I begin to, to focus on all how God had a point, uh, abandoned me and all the things that was wrong. And, and then by the time my wife was in the last two months, I begin to hear the Lord speaking so clearly to me. And he said, in order for me to grow with him, that I must move from just submitting. We understood that she was going to, she was going to, to lose her life. We knew it. I knew it. He had already told me clearly. I couldn't tell anybody. I was carrying the burden. Because if I speak it, people think I don't have faith. I never lack faith. I know God is able. But I know what God told me. And he's preparing me. And he's telling me to prepare my house. It took me forever. I would put off doing this wheel. And if I did not do this wheel, my wife was told she would not make it for Sunday. This was three months before she passed. I begged God, the doctor told me, go get my kids. And on my way to the house, I told God, if you would give her an extension, I would do the wheel stuff. I had done something online and didn't know anything about these laws and stuff in the U.S. And sure enough, I tell God I'm going to do it. Because I know he was probing me to fix things. And sure enough, when I went to the lawyer, because the Monday, she wasn't going to make it to Sunday night. So I went to get my girls. Saturday night, she made it through. Sunday morning, she's still there. She was in some crisis state. They had to jumpstart her heart. I'm watching all this stuff. By Sunday afternoon, they pulled her off a lot of their machinery and stuff they were doing. And then Monday, she's still there. Tuesday, they transferred her from critical care, put her in a room. She's still not conscious. All that time, haven't said a word, barely can open her eyes. They begin to give her uh, nutrition with a feeding tube. This lasted for about two weeks, three weeks. Still not communicating. And only me and my daughters. Just there, just us. And at that time, within the space of time, every time I'd leave the hospital, my daughter would stay. I'd go in to call a lawyer, figure this thing out. Come to find out I had a wheel I did online. It was one page. When the lawyer was done with me, this thing was like about 16 or 17 pages. Of stuff that needed to take care of. That would have messed up the life of my kids if I didn't do this stuff. And I was just so troubled in my spirit. But God gave me this extension. My wife came out, was doing rehab, was actually walking. Little steps, but was walking. And at that time, we sent the girls out to have a little vacation. They spent the whole summer in the hospital. And me and my wife had the deepest of conversations last. And I told her what God showed me during this time. He told me that I have to move from just submitting because he's going to have his way either way. Yeah. Whether you submit or not, his will will be done. Yeah. And so he says, as you mature in this, I don't look for you to just submit. I want you to agree with me. Oh, that hit me so hard. I'm like, what you mean agree with you? And then it hit my spirit. It made so much sense. It was so rich. That when you get to the place where you agree with God. God knows he's got everything from you. It's what Abraham did. When the son God promised him. God tell him take him up on the mountain and sacrifice. And Abraham was willing because he agreed with God. And the scripture declares that the, the, the angel of the Lord came and he said no I know. I said but hold on a minute God you the omnipotent God. You the omniscient God. What do you mean now you know? You let the brother put a knife over his son. Then you're talking about now you know. Yeah now you know because you see God knows everything. But he doesn't have everything in experiential knowledge. Sometimes God have to wait for you to praise him for him to experience you praising him. And so he says, no, I know. Because he saw the experience of Abraham willing to go all in. And that's why Abraham is in the hall of faith. This is the same Abraham that went wrong and fooled around with Hagar. But he came to a place in his life where he had not more than submitted. He had agreed with God. And so when God called my wife home, I agreed with him that this was the right thing. I'm still living with the consequences of it. I'm having to do things that a father and a mother has to do. But I'm okay with it because I agree with God. 
I don't know how it's going to end. I don't know when the season is going to end. But I agree with God. I shift my focus from what I can see, from what I can hear, from what I can touch. And now I give God praise because it's the weapon that gets me through it. And so I'll close with this. The same woman that was despised, that nobody wanted, not even her father couldn't get her married. He had to sneak her out. When you look at the genealogy of our Savior, Jesus Christ, you don't see in that genealogy line, you don't see anybody from Rachel. Rachel had Joseph and Benjamin. Joseph have a wonderful story. You saw that. But Joseph is not the forefather of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It wasn't none of the first three boys that Leah had. The woman that was rejected and hated was so whatever she was looking like with her weak eye and all had to be sneaked in to marry. It was the first time in her life when she shifted herself from off herself and she began to praise God. The Bible says she named this boy Judah and Judah, you know, David came out of that, that whole lineage and Jesse and all of these folks, Boaz, all of this came through and you could see the line and trace it right through Judah. Oh, when you begin to shift your focus and praise God, he will open up things for you. You will see the doors open and it will always be beyond yourself, you see. God is not looking to just work in you. He wants to do a redemptive work that will touch your family, that will touch the nation, that will touch the world. And so you're just caught up in yourself. Oh, here's what I can see. There ain't nobody looking at me. Nobody's touching me. I'm, nobody's hearing me. And God said, if you would praise me, I would unlock the door and you... And so, this time, the Bible says, she said this time. Somebody needs a this time testimony tonight, today. This is your time. This is your time. And God would disturb my life because it's a sovereign plan. So that you would have new life. And so this word we knew is not, a, it's not something from me. This is not me. I'm not qualified. My, my brother went to Moody. The dude know how to divide the word. This is not from me. This is from God. I'm not that smart. You hear what I'm telling you? What the men received, they received from God. That's why he told, he told Pastor Al. This is not us making this up. We're not that brilliant. The spirit of God. This time. You don't mess the wrong in 23. And you're living the same way you lived last year. And the year before. But this time. Would you stand on your feet this morning? Go ahead. Go ahead. Let's stand this morning. We're getting ready to close.